listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled Digital Energy from Survive to Thrive. European think tanks are forming scenarios on the race to deliver digital energy or the digitalization of energy. Here's some of the evolving thinking based on a workshop I attended recently with the International Energy Agency in Paris. About 120 global experts, academics, regulators, and leading companies contributed their insights under a Chatham House Rules format to the discussion. If you haven't listened to the preceding podcast in this series, I encourage you to do so to get context and background. Otherwise, this podcast may seem a little too obscure. To repeat, the world of energy is wrestling with a number of perplexing questions. What will be the impact of digital on energy, and when will the impact be felt? Number two, which companies are best positioned to survive and thrive in the turmoil of digital change? Number three, what are the most significant barriers that must be overcome? And number four, what should government energy ministries be aware of, and more importantly, do, about digital? The first question in this series addressed the issue of the size of the impact digital would have on the energy industry and when that impact would be manifest. The conclusion was that digital will be very big, it will penetrate the industry thoroughly, but it will take a long time. This begs the second question, who wins and who loses? Participants in the energy industry are used to placing big bets to win, but usually in areas where they may have some specialized knowledge, like oil exploration. Digital is moving so quickly that it's not clear which bets will pay off and which will be written off. A consensus from the workshop is that the incumbents were for the moment still in a strong position. They have the resources, the trust of society, the scale, the capabilities, and access to an established ecosystem. These advantages take decades to assemble in regulated and often publicly owned monopolistic industries that value scale. My experience in the industry suggests that almost all industry incumbents of substance have some kind of digital exploration underway, and those efforts are generally aimed at improving existing business models. However, the threat from startups is very real. All of the coolest and transformative business efforts shared in the workshop, those that fundamentally challenged the status quo, were from smaller, fast-moving, nimble, and risk-oriented startups. That threat shows up in the stock market. Markets are placing outsized value on the potential of these disruptive businesses. For example, Tesla has a stock market valuation greater than Ford and General Motors, even though Ford, as for one example, sells more F-Series pickup trucks in a three-week period than Tesla sells of all of its vehicles in a year. The market believes that the Tesla story, that is, sexy, fast electric cars, sold direct, with over-the-cloud software updates, interconnected in a vast learning network to deliver eventually self-driving solutions, is going to deliver superior returns over the incumbents. In another interpretation, the market may have concluded that the incumbent automakers are so saddled with internal impediments that they will simply fail to make the transition to keep pace with Tesla. But what if you combined the incumbents with some of these upstarts? Combining the advantages of the incumbents with the disruptive ideas of the startups would be really potent. Policies and programs that promote engagement between startups and incumbents, such as ecosystems and innovation centers, are really helpful. In contrast, government policies that overly coddle the incumbents, block innovation, slow digital uptake, or chase innovators away will exact a longer-term toll. Indeed, the value of some innovations actually grows exponentially the more people use it. This network effect can create nearly insurmountable barriers to new challengers. Therefore, first-mover advantages do matter. Incumbents can be caught out by not getting involved early enough. One key emerging theme from the workshops was the role of data, ownership, and privacy. Pioneering disruptors who are experiencing success do so where they get access to industry data. Their success appears to rest on the notion that the data about an individual consumer's energy use is at least partially owned by the consumer, who can choose to share that data. Regulators in the most advanced economies are therefore forcing incumbents to unlock their data assets for innovators to use and allow that data to cross borders. Therefore, a winning company or industry participant will likely be those that are leveraging data in some way. That, or they will make electric two-seater transportation like bikes and scooters. You heard it here first. Let's turn now to the biggest barriers. 
Well, we've written about the key digital blockers and barriers in earlier articles, and the 120 assembled thinkers at the workshop added to that otherwise rich discussion of problems. Number one are government policies. The most cited barrier to digital innovation was the mashed up regulatory framework that govern heavily regulated industries. These frameworks favor the incumbents and generally inhibit the movement of data that is often the basis for new digital business models. Number two is management attitudes. CEOs of incumbent energy organizations get digital and the potential or threat it poses. So do frontline workers who crave easier ways to work. The problem looks to be getting middle managers to embrace digital change. Number three are the demanding hurdles. Internal competition for capital in the incumbents could be damaging. Some larger companies have thresholds as high as $1 billion in new revenue for their company to invest in new businesses, including digital. Few organizations have the prescience to identify with that kind of precision how a digital business will evolve. Who could have predicted the size of Snapchat, Google, Facebook, and Uber? Big incumbents may be their own worst enemy in the digital world. Number four was standards, or more importantly, lack thereof. One researcher has identified over 50 standard setting bodies for digital and over 650 digital standards, including those embedded in other hardware standards. Therefore, there are no standards in digital. The lack of standards is already an impediment and is poised to worsen over time. Finally, our cyber worries. Digital technologies for energy, that is sensors, gauges, and meters, are potentially highly vulnerable to cyber attack and legacy infrastructure was never designed for digital in the first instance. Cyber risks are now at the board level. Next is what should be the government stance. There are some very early lessons to be taken from the pioneers in the digital realm and these lessons can inform policy choices that governments and regulators will need to make. Failure to take action could relegate whole economies to be dependent on next generation software and digital businesses from foreign countries. That can't be good. So therefore, what should be governments be aware of with respect to digital? First, the digital sector is moving at an unstoppable and blistering pace. That pace is far faster than sectors have traditionally evolved because it's software based, not hardware based. Most companies cannot keep up. A public sector that is oriented more to the rhythm of an annual budget cycle and a four-year electoral cycle, lengthy public consultations, infrastructure investments that last decades, and dominant legal frameworks that can date back hundreds of years are not well aligned with what is now a 24-month hardware cycle and a software cycle that turns over every six months. Next is the pervasiveness of digital. It's impacting everything. At the same time, Residences, manufacturing, logistics, healthcare, finance, energy, agriculture. Our world is likely to be unrecognizable in just a few years' time. We better get used to it. Next is policy know how. There's simply not enough public policy know how in digital. This is showing up in delayed regulatory responses to digital, knee jerk reactions to digital innovations, and inconsistent policy positions. Policymakers need to recognize that there are no answers to digital, merely an ever evolving set of plausible scenarios. And last but not least are the talent issues. It takes a long time to produce a competent workforce in any discipline, including digital, and Western society is way behind in preparing to meet the need, particularly in the technical skills of science, technology, engineering, and maths, or STEM for short. Shortages of key skills like cyber are already emerging. Last but not least is what advice would there be for public policy setters? The entire meeting, in fact, was aimed at, at uh, surfacing advice. Here's my conclusions. Number one, visit Estonia. Why Estonia? Because they are the undisputed global leader in embracing a digital future. They've adopted a simple and compelling digital vision for their nation and a set of principles to achieve it. Number two is to unlock data, to unlock digital. If governments want to participate in and take full advantage of the rising digital economy, they must unlock the data. This means overhauling outdated regulatory frameworks that make data a private asset owned by those who collected it, the incumbents, and not those who originated it, the consumers. That should not mean sacrificing privacy rules, of course. Number three is to create the future workforce. A national digital future does not rest on the premise of a natural endowment like resources. Any nation can participate, provided they have the human capital. 
take a look at STEM enrollment and performance on STEM tests to see how you stack up, and change up education to create deep STEM capabilities. Next is to challenge your investments. Lots of governments own energy assets and companies. Challenge them to create a digital future or risk being left behind. Next is to encourage trials. Governments need to learn, too. One way is to copy industry and run some field or closed trials to understand digital behavior. Trials may need to be done very transparently so that any company involvement does not create an uneven market playing field. And last but not least, invest in yourself. Build up the policy skills by investing in your own people, recruiting in talented leaders, and leveraging exchanges with the private sector. One thing's for certain, the energy future is going to be a lot more digital, so we may as well get ready. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.